all want in life is a shot. But what we do with it, that's the story we all want to tell. You know, I've coached for 25 years and I've never experienced that, uh, you know, the emotional high of uh, what happened. What happened for Jason McKelwin, or JMAC as his friends call him, is about more than a shot. Diagnosed with autism at two years old, now identified as highly functioning, he's never considered himself different or separate, especially when it comes to sports. Sports has always been, how could I say, his equalizer. He's like, just like any of the other kids out there. It's not really a big deal at all. I'm just, I'm just normal like other people. That's the way I am. At five foot six, J Mac didn't make the junior varsity basketball team at his high school, Greece Athena, near Rochester, New York. Instead, he became team manager, a role he now has for the varsity as a senior. In the last three years, in his white shirt and black tie, he's missed only one game. We want to practice. I set up the clock and get the water in the games and be enthusiastic. <laughs> As this season was wrapping up, Coach Johnson approached Jason with an idea about the Trojans' final home game of the season. I said, you know, I'm really going to work to try to get you in the game, but remember, I can't promise you that. And he goes, okay, Coach. February 15th, Greece Athena against Spencerport, senior night. With word out that Jason might play, the student section printed signs of J-Mac's face, just in case. And with 419 left in the game, with the Trojans up by 20, coach called down to the end of the bench for number 52. I just kind of turned and pointed at him, and uh, he almost ran right on the court. He was so excited. Hey, Jay, you got to check in. So it's a buzzer. He doesn't go anywhere. Like, now you go on the court. You know, he was so, he was so caught up in the moment. He came into the game, they all stood up and they put the signs, uh, you know, the pictures of him up, and I got really emotional. And I sat down and started crying. With 3.46 left, Jason got the ball. When he missed that first three, I was like, oh, and then it air ball, and I was like, man, I really just want to see him score one time. I put my head in my hands, I like, dear God, please, this, we just got my basket. Then, with 312 left, another chance. That third trip down the court. Magic. As soon as I started hitting my first shot, I just kept shooting. And I was just hot as a pistol. Shot after shot after shot. Kept going in. The basket was like a speed hole shoes bucket. And uh I was shooting like there were free throws. This is a big old Jewish bucket that's like huge. And I was like, oh my god, is this really happening? He has more than more points than me, so he's got bragging rights over me. He was unstoppable for that moment in time. He was unstoppable. He comes down the court right at the end with like three seconds left and he hits this one that's you know, probably like an NBA three. As soon as the gun ended, they stormed the court. I couldn't, you know, I just couldn't dream of anything like that. It was probably like we won a championship. Yeah, everyone was just so happy for him. In that four minutes, 19 seconds, Jason was seven for 13, six of 10 from three point range, 20 points in all. In his first and only varsity basketball game, J-Mac was the high scorer. Truly the most incredible moment I've ever had in coaching. I was so touched. And um, it, it was just so special to me that a young man, his dream came true. Yeah. And that I could help that was awesome. What we all want in life is a shot. J-Mac took his. And now it's a story we can all tell. Isn't that the essence of leadership when you can shine the light on someone else on your team? And today, 
as we take this journey together. My promise to you is to inspire you through this story and other illustrations, and also give you seven keys that you can implement in your own life to help you become a more effective leader. So I'm gonna start with a pretty easy question, but it's gonna be a lot of a focus of our presentation today. And that is, who's the first person you must lead? And of course, it's yourself. And what I found through my many years of leading teams is you can't be an effective leader if you can't first lead yourself. And so I think it's a really powerful thing as we take this journey, we're gonna give you some ideas today to help you lead yourself better so you can lead your teams better, your families and every other possible leadership situation. Next question is a little bit more difficult because there's no real correct answer, but I want you to think, you can put it in the chat. And the question is, uh, is in one word, how would you define leadership? And think for a moment, but there is a word in my mind that jumps out above all the others. Okay, if anybody shares it, one in the chat, uh, if not, that's okay too. We get any words, John? I don't see anything yet. Okay. Yeah, I see Empowerment, Empowerment I see. Okay, all right, great. Uh, so th there's a lot of good positive words that are important in leadership, but the word that stands out to me is influence. And the reason I believe influence is such a major factor in leadership, we think of positive leaders like Dr. Martin Luther King or Mahatma Gandhi that both led in a very positive way. But certainly there are other leaders that had a lot of influence but led in a negative way. Adolf Hitler comes to mind. So with that though, we're gonna focus on leading with the positive. So with that in mind, we're gonna take you through this journey and I'm gonna start a little bit with uh, my story. And my story started that I, I got into basketball pretty serious in high school. In fact, I became a pretty good high school player. In fact, in my mind, I thought I was such a great player that I was gonna to go to college, have a wonderful career, and then probably go right to the NBA. Well, in my second year in college, I didn't make the team, I was cut. So that really shattered my NBA dreams. But it made, it made me kind of go awry in college for a little while. But fortunately, my junior year, I was able to meet a young lady that helped straighten my life out. In fact, she straightened my life out so well that it, we've been married now for 38 years, my wife, Pat. Well, after she helped guide me back on, then I really started dreaming again. And when I graduated from college, my dream was to come back to Rochester and specifically to Greece, my hometown. And I wanted to be a head coach in my hometown. That was my ultimate dream. Well, after three years as an assistant at 25 years old, which is pretty young in my career, I became a head coach at a school about 20 minutes from where I grew up. And I was excited. And although this program wasn't in very good shape. I thought when my great coach and acumen, I was going to lead that team from the outhouse to the penthouse in the first year. Well, after our first two games we were one and one, I thought, I've got this. I'm in good shape. Then with my great coaching wizardry, I led that team to 17 consecutive losses. Then I left that job because I didn't like what the administration had to say to me after the season. Of course, what they said to me was, you're fired. And that was a very, very humbling experience. But in hindsight, it ended up being probably the best professional experience I've ever experienced for two reasons. Reason number one is it really made me realize that I had a lot to learn and that I was, I needed to start studying leadership if I was gonna be a better coach. And that started my journey. And I really highly recommend anything you wanna be great in, you have to study it. And the second reason is it put a burn in my belly, that famous motivation that I was gonna prove that school wrong. And that burn never went away for the last 30 years of my career. Well, after that, the next year, 
I got an opportunity. I got a break. I got a call from a local junior college coach. His name was Bill Van Gundy. And if you follow basketball at all, you probably have heard of the Van Gum Gundy family because his sons, Jeff and Stan, have been head coaches in the NBA. In fact, Stan is the head coach in the New Orleans Pelicans right now. Well, Coach Van Gundy took me under his wing and helped me give me some guidance. And between his teaching and just my own study, I started to pick up these seven keys that I now want to share with you as we go through this journey together. So the uh, first key is clarifying your vision. And we're going to get right into that in just a moment. Second one is, is significant in that you're building trust. And that's very powerful and something we'll get into in a little bit. Third one is what I call creating the edge. Number four is effective communication. Five is, of course, lead by example. Six is my leadership philosophy, which I call leaving a profit. And then the last one is really what I consider the essence of leadership and something we really got to focus on to become a better leader. And that is called servant leadership. So with those seven keys, after that year working with Coach Van Gundy, I got an opportunity to go back to the high school level because that was my dream. I wanted to be a head coach in the high school level. And I got named and I became a teacher and a coach at Leroy High School, a school about 30 minutes from me. And their program wasn't in very good shape. They had only won two games the year before we got there. And so the first thing that I really worked on is becoming a better leader of me. So that started with clarifying your vision. And something I, I'm going to challenge you with a couple things today. And the first one is how many of you have a personal mission statement that you've written down? Because that changed my life when I got clarity about my mission and what I stood for, my why in life. And so I highly recommend, and I'm going to give you just a couple little tips. I delve into it deeper in one of my workshops, but how you can have clarity of who you are, because that's going to help you so much as a leader if you know who you are. So the people that you lead are very clear about that. And you could see my mission on the is to be an outstanding role model that makes a positive difference in the world by helping others make their dreams come true. Now, what is yours? Now, one little tip for you is that what we want you to do is think for a moment what are your three most important values? And those are things, that if you're not clear, you should write those down. You could share in the chat your most important if you want. But for me, integrity. Another one was service to others. So when I just started to really get clarity about my values, then I started to put down, because I believe you discover your personal mission statement. So when I took over at Leroy, I came in and I had more clarity of the person I was. And I shared that with them. These are my expectations. This is what I'm all about. And it helped get us off to a better start from there. In fact, so this is something that's going to be a process, but I highly recommend if I can ever help you in the future, reach out to me, but it is that really get clarity about your own personal mission statement. And of course, our homework assignment is to put your personal mission statement in writing. I, I believe it'll help you immensely. Once I had clarity for that, as I was working with the players at Leroy, the other thing, because I know I talk to a lot of businesses and in, in college and high schools, is that I, I talked to them about you know, do you have your own mission for your business or your team mission? And when, when I, we talked about that, I started to ask my players, because I think it's really important that you do get feedback. And if you do have a, a mission, because I work with businesses and I see some great mission statements, but then I'll talk to some people in the business and they don't even know what the mission statement is. Then that's not good. So you really want to have clarity about what your mission is and that you're living it daily. It's great to put it up on a bulletin board, but if you're not living it with clarity, we could see our mission at the programs that I took over was that we wanted to develop winners on and off the court because the players wanted to win. They had not been winning. But I said, you know what, in all my studying, whether it's winning games or profits for business, you got to have something bigger. So when we talked about winning on and off the court, we talked first of all about, yes, 
winning on the scoreboard is part of it. But are you a good teammate? Are you someone that can handle adversity and be a good sport? Are you someone that's an outstanding citizen in the community? How about a great student? Those are all things we want to develop the whole person. And the interesting thing, as we develop that, the results on the scoreboard got much better. In fact, we won eight games our first year and we won 13 our second year. But after my second year, my major dream came true. I get a call from my hometown district, Greece Central, and they were going to offer me the basketball position and a teaching job in Greece at Greece Olympia High School. And I was really excited. But I knew that we had a lot of work to do because Leroy had been in a tough situation, only winning two games before I got there. Well, at Olympia, they had only won two games the two previous seasons. So we had a lot of work. In fact, they only had one winning season in the past decade. But when we got there, we talked about what I was all about. We talked about our team mission, but we really had to focus on with all that negativity in the program of the second key, and that is building trust. And to me, building trust is like building a bank account. If you consistently put deposits in, what's going to happen? Of course, it's going to grow. But if you continue to take withdrawals out, what will happen? It will get smaller. So well, I'm going to give you one caveat as we go through the, our trust foundation, is that how many would agree that it takes time to build trust but you can really ruin it and destroy it with one really bad move. In fact, I'll give you two quick illustrations. One of the things we emphasized in our program is we wanted our players on time. Now, if they came to practice late, then would that hurt the trust account? Yes, it would. Would it shatter? Probably not. It's something we want to work on. But a stronger illustration is that one of the things I did in the last 20 years of my coaching career is after the teams were picked, I would get in front of all the players in our program and their parents. And I would share that because I wanted to be a great role model that I would not drink alcohol during the season. Now, if I said that and two weeks later, I got a DWI, what do you think would have happened to that trust? It would have been shared. I probably never got a bad. Fortunately, I never made that bad decision. But that's something to really think about for yourself. You know, are you aligning, which we go through, because I think it's hugely important that you building trust, that you have a plan. So I want to take you through our three steps of building trust. So the first one is that we want to say what we're going to do and do what we're going to say. In other words, we want to align our actions and our words. We had to be consistent. And that's something that we really had to be thinking about all the time. Are you being consistent with your words and your actions? Number two is we wanted to build the foundation of telling the truth. In telling the truth, as the Bible says, the truth will set you free. I think it's very impactful to make sure that when you're talking about the truth, that you do have some tact. Sometimes you say in public and sometimes you say it behind closed doors. And the other thing is as a leader in telling the truth, I believe effective leaders are ability, they have the ability to be vulnerable. And what do I mean by that? That means that when you make a mistake, you're willing to admit it and share that and then correct it. Because when you open yourself up where you can admit your faults, then that will give trust in your team that they can admit their faults and you can work together. Certainly, you want to correct your errors, but you, you've got to be able to be authentic and vulnerable as you move through. And the third thing, because we had so much negativity at Greece Olympia, that one of the things we really wanted to focus in on was catching people doing the right thing. And so what we would often have in practices, I would call, talk to my staff and I'd say, let's just do a be positive. Will we recognize and praise when somebody does something well, like if they dive on the floor for a loose ball or they make the extra pass, you know, those are basketball things. You can do it in your own world. How can you consistently praise whether it's verbal, whether you can now text back then I couldn't text, but also, you know, give a phone call. Write a personal note. Those are all powerful ways, but really focus on catching people doing the right thing. That is such a powerful thing. So 
And taking that journey at Greece Olympia is in our second year, we had a winning season. I thought, oh, we've got this going. I was wrong. In our third season, we plummeted down to only two wins. So we knew he still had a lot of work to do on building that trust. So we kept after and kept after. We told you trust takes time. And so what we did is we really worked on that. In our last three years at Olympia, we had three of the best seasons ever in the school history. We were number one seed in the sectional tournament, which they had never done two years in a row. And we made the sectional semifinals for three consecutive years. They had never even gotten that far before. So we were really starting to, to get things going in a real positive direction. Then an interesting thing happened to me is the Greece Athena job, one of our sister schools opened up and I always felt that was the best job. And for a lot of reasons, I'm not gonna get into. So I decided to apply and I was offered the job. And there, when we took over at Athena, they had had a losing season, but they had had a winning tradition. In fact, they won a state championship with a guy named John Wallace that played in the NBA. So I, I really felt with these ideas that we could really go in and really have a successful program. And I was right. In fact, when we went in, the third thing is after we talked about trust and we talked about who I was in our mission, we really shared about some ideas of how we could create an edge to make our program even better. And that I believe as a leader, you should become an idea gatherer, always trying to find ways to make yourself better and your team better. Well, in doing that, I'm gonna give you two ideas and we're gonna take you through just a little activity today. So the first thing is, I believe you should use other voices. And I'll give you an illustration. In our program, we had winning seasons in my first seven or eight years, but we didn't even make it back to the sectional semifinals. So that was kind of my stumbling block. And one of the things I realized is that our players had to get stronger. So I actually hired a strength coach. That's very common in today's sports, but it was not so common back then. And so I was a little bit ahead of my time there, and it was really helpful to use other voices. The second thing is, as we spent a lot of time with our players, on teaching them how to be effective goal setters. In fact, I do a whole workshop on goal setting because it's, it's such a, a powerful topic. But I'm gonna give you one activity that we used to do with our players just to get them focused. But what we would do is after we chose our team, we would bring them over to my house and we'd have a team meeting. We'd talk about our mission, talk about our rules and regulations, and we would also talk about our team goals and we would get those down in writing. As I like to say, one of my favorite goal quotes is when you think it, ink it, which of course means write it down. Have you gotten your goals? Because we're gonna take you through a little activity. Then another important part as a leader is we, at, at that meeting, our team meeting, I would set up individual appointments and we would teach our guys, we would give them an individual goal setting sheet. And I believe as a leader, you need to meet with individuals so you know their goals and how they work with the team and if they understanding their role in the team. Those are so powerful things. So let's take you through a little activity. And what I'm right now is I want you to write down, you got 30 seconds, your three most important goals. You are on the clock. Ready, go. Twenty seconds. Ten seconds. Five, three, two, one. All right, in, in setting those goals, if you weren't able to do that, then is a, another quote I used to give, you can't hit a target you don't have. So I think it's really clear and I, it's really important that you write your goals down. And I'll give you a couple tips we used to teach our players is we'd have our players write their goals down in cards. And it was something I've been doing for decades where I would get in front of a mirror, I've already done it today. And I get in front of a mirror and I would start the day by saying, I am responsible. Then I would say, I like myself because I wanted, I got to like myself before I can help others. And then I would go through my goals. 
And I think it's a really powerful exercise that we do. And I'm going to give you just another little assignment is that I think it's really important to have accountability. So getting an accountability partner, but right now you can throw in the chat or just write it down for yourself is that what is one action step you're going to do on one of your most important goals starting today. So go ahead, we'll give you a few seconds. And this is something you can do as homework. And the other thing I will say is I believe you should try to get an accountability partner with various goals and, and check in with each other is very helpful. All right, great. Well, we're gonna to have to move on, but it, so working at Athena, as I mentioned, we had had successful teams and finally, in my eighth year, we got to the sectional semifinal for the fourth time in my career, and we got beat again. The next year, I had a young man come into our program. His name was Jason McElwain. I later tanked him the name J-Mac because I couldn't pronounce his last name. And fortunately, he liked it. But Jason came into our program and tried out for our JV team after a few days of trials, my JV coach came to me and said, Coach, Jason's not a very good player, but man, he's got this big heart and he loves basketball and he loves the guys. I think we should keep him in the program. Now, Jason is on the autism spectrum. How many people know someone on the spectrum? Because it's become very, very prevalent. Well, back then, I did not know much about autism, but I said, yeah, let's give Jason a shot. And so he offered him the team manager's job. And I will say early in the season, there were some trials and tribulations as Jason got used to his new teammates and his new teammates got used to Jason. But our culture had really been built quite well. And I started to really see the bond first from the JV players. And then Jason would sit on the bench during JV games. Of course, they, they sit lightly because he would get what I call a tad emotional. And after the game, he would be a little bit disheveled. And it would always warm my heart because he wanted to stay on the bench for the varsity games. They see one of our varsity players come over before they warmed up and straighten out his shirt and tie and get him ready to sit on the bench for the varsity game. Well, during... Jason's sophomore season. The JVs had a good record and so did the varsity. And the varsity actually went on and got to the sectional semifinals now for the fifth time in my career. And we got beat again. We were really disappointed, but that was not gonna stop J-Mac. He was more bound and determined to make the varsity as a junior. So he, what was different about Jason, because in my many years in coaching, if a young man got caught, they really tried out the next year. But Jason not only wanted to try out, but he came to all our off-season workouts. And he, I was starting to really get a nice bond. I would pick him up at his house. And he was really uh, just a beautiful young man. Well, his senior, junior year, he comes out for the team. And after a few days of tryouts, I bring him in. I said, Jason, unfortunately, you're not quite good enough to make the team but I would like to offer you the team manager's job for the varsity. Well, he quickly embraced that role. In fact, in our first team meeting that year, you talk about using other voices. He raises his hand and I, he said, I said, yes, Jason. He says, coach, I need to share a slogan with the team we're gonna and adopt this year. And I said, what's that? He says, we're gonna stay focused and we're gonna help you win your first sectional championship. So, well, thank Jason. Well, we had another great season. We got Jason's junior year to the sectional semifinal now for the sixth time in my career. And we lose at the buzzer to our crosstown rival, Greece Arcadia. We are devastated, but that's not gonna stop J-Mac. He's more bound and determined to make the team as a senior. Again, he comes to all our off season workouts. And he's getting better, but we have a lot returning. So I know it's gonna be difficult for him. He tries out his senior year. After a few days of tryouts, I bring him in. And this time I turn to him and I said, J-Mac, I've got some good news and some bad news. He looks up to me and says, yeah, coach, give me the bad news first. I said, well, unfortunately, you're still not quite good enough to be on the team. This time his head dropped down. He's visibly disappointed. 
I said, but I do have some good news. He said, yeah, coach, what do you got in mind? I said, well, for senior night, I'm going to give you a uniform and hopefully get you in the game. Well, he was pretty excited about that uniform idea. In fact, periodically, he would ask me about that uniform. And of course, I define periodically as about every other day. He was quite excited. Well, we were expecting to have a really good season, Jason, senior year. And it started well. We won our first two games. We were 2-0. and And then adversity struck. And we don't have time to go through it. But have you ever been on a team that was divided? This isn't very difficult. In fact, I wrote a book about it. I'll talk a little bit more at the end called The Coach in a Miracle, where I go through this story. But our team that was really talented now was divided. And it really reflected. In our next five games, we lost three of them. And I was beside myself. And I was like, what are we going to do? We, we just aren't doing it. You know, when I was doing all these different team things and meeting with players, but it, we were really struggling. So we went to a Christmas tournament at Fairport, the biggest school in Rochester. And they were really good that year. And I thought we were going to be really good, but not the way we were together. Well, in the opening round of the tournament, we won in a close game. In the second game, Fairport beat this team by like 40 points that we had barely beaten two weeks earlier. The next day, because we didn't have school because it was during Christmas break, I brought the team into what we call a shoot around, which is about an hour practice. And we usually bring balls out and do some shooting and do some different plays and that type of thing. But I knew I had to shock them, which leads into my fourth key. And that is being an effective communicator. And the first thing when I talk about communication, I think as a leader, it is important to become a better public speaker. I do know some great leaders that aren't great public speakers, but I think it's helpful. And I was becoming better. And so I started our practice of it. I didn't bring any balls out. I sat in the bleachers. I looked them right in the eyes. I said, guys, I don't want to go to the game tonight. And they looked at me shocked. What do you mean you don't want to go to the game tonight? Then I gave him a little motivational talk and I just shared, gentlemen, unless we decide we're going to be together and play together, Fairport's going to beat us by 50 points tonight. So I gave him a little motivational thing. But the most important thing I learned about communication, and this is where I really improved, was the ability to become a better listener. The old adage, you have two ears and only one mouth. So you should listen twice as much as you talk, minimum, is really powerful. And what I did next really helped our season turn around. I said, guys, I don't have all the answers. Being vulnerable, but we need to share some ideas on how we can unite this team. And then they finally opened up and we've got some great ideas and we started to unite. It didn't solve all our issues, but there was a different bounce in our step as we walked out of the gym that night. When we walked in to play Fairport, I could feel a difference and it manifested in the game. We played a great game. And although we didn't win, we lost to them in overtime and it showed what we could do if we played together and worked together. From there, we got some momentum and we won eight out of our next nine games going into senior night. Now, senior night is on February 15th. I, as a coach, I had 30 of them. So it's always a very special night. On February 13th, I gave J-Mac his first jersey. It was number 52. It was way too big. He didn't care. In fact, there was a rumor going around in school that he slept in it for two straight nights. Well, on senior night, it was profoundly touching to see Jason, instead of in his white shirt and black tie, he's now donning number 52 in uniform, and he's embracing his parents before the game. It's a memory. I will always cherish. Well, the game begins. And we had a really good student body following. They called themselves the six men. And at the opening tap, I started hearing, we want J-Mac. We want J-Mac. I guess just in case we forgot. Well, going to the game, I had three ideas. Idea number one is because we had railed in the season, we won that game, we had a chance to tie for the division championship. Number two, although I wanted to get Jason in the game, I knew it was important that I got all the other players in before I can put J-Mac in. And number three, I wanted to get J-Mac in with enough time so he could score a basket. I thought if he could score a basket, that's a memory he'll keep the rest of his life. Well, after th three quarters of the game, we had gotten everybody in but Jason. So with just over four minutes to go, I turned and pointed to him. He nearly ran on the court. He was so excited. 
Then he got to the scorer's table. And I'm usually a pretty, pretty macho guy. And I usually don't cry at basketball games. But what happened next profoundly touched my heart and soul. When Jason entered the game, he got a standing ovation from his peers, the six men. But what I didn't know and what Jason didn't know is one of our parents had made all these pictures, these placards of Jason's face and put them on paint sticks. And they showed him. And when Jason got on the floor, I was so overwhelmed with emotion that I sat down. Tears started to roll down my face. I was so touched. Now the game begins. J Mac is now in his first varsity basketball game. The first time we get the ball, Jason gets it in the right corner behind the three point arc. He lets it go. The crowd stands in anticipation. It misses by like six feet. Now, I know you're not supposed to pray in the public schools, but I am praying, dear God, please help them. But what a great lesson we can all learn from this. Because how many times when you try something for the first time and you fail miserably, like Jason did by shooting an air ball, we just give up. Great lesson, because Jason had that essence of perseverance, that never give up mindset. We used to call it next play. You got to move on, learn from it, but move on. And Jason just did that so well. Next possession. This time he gets the ball from about 10 feet. And I got to add a little drama because it might be a movie someday. He shoots it. It hits the backboard. It hits the rim and it falls off. The crowd groans. I'm thinking, all right, God's starting to listen. We're getting closer. Third possession, Jason receives the ball this time at the right wing behind the three-point line. He lets it go. Magic. It goes in. The place explodes. I'm thinking to myself, God must be a basketball fan. Not only has Jason scored, he's got a three-pointer. It can't be better than this, right? Wrong. For the next three minutes, J-Mac turns into his boyhood idol, the late great Kobe Bryant, and he starts making shots. After shot, the place is going crazier and crazier. The two things I'll never forget. With about a minute to go in the game, I'm still sitting down and tears still rolling down my face. And I get a tap on my shoulder. I look behind me, it's J Mac's mother. She's bawling her eyes out and she whispers in my ear, Coach, this is the best gift you could have ever given my son. What would you have done if you heard that? I cried harder. Then this is how the game ends. With about 10 seconds to go, Spencer Port, our opponent, and I want to give kudos to their coach and their players. They were great sports. They score, and our player takes it out of bounds and normally throws it to a point guard, but he throws it right to J-Mac. So when J-Mac's dribbling down the court, I look up. I'm thinking he's just going to go in and make a short shot and end the game. Oh, no, is the clock's kicking down? Three, two, one. I see Jason pull up like two feet behind the arc. He lets go of this rainbow. I'm thinking, Jason, don't shoot from there. That's way too far. Swish. I look over. Our student body runs on the floor. Our players run on the floor. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I'm living the movie Rudy. But this is really true. Then the interesting dynamic is dad is six foot six and his mom is five foot two. And I see this little bitty lady bobbing and weaving through the entire crowd. She gets to Jason, gives him a big hug. Jason liked that for a moment. Then our players put him up on their shoulders. And he's got the game ball over his head. And at this point, I have no idea how many points he has. And our public address announcer comes on and says, the leading scorer for the Trojans, James Heck, with 20 points. And when my math brain, I'm thinking, if he played the whole game, he'd have scored 160. That's pretty good. The two great things from that is you talk about the essence of team. As I told you, we had some real issues that year. And I never asked the players on the court to pass Jason the ball. Yet in those last four minutes, Jason was the only one that shot. In fact, I still kid Jason all the time. I said, Jason, I'm still looking for your first assist. You never passed the ball once. But isn't that the essence of teamwork and leadership when you shine the light on someone else on your team? And then secondly, I felt I did it for all the right reasons. We didn't have any media there. In fact, my only responsibility with the media is after the game, I had to call it into our local newspaper, the Democrat and Chronicle. And when I did, I shared the, our team manager 
they scored 20 points. I thought he for sure he would get a headline the next day. So I barely sleep that night. I get up the next morning, I look up the sports page, and we do get a headline, but it says Trojans, our team nickname, ties for league title. And it says just a little bit about Jason. I, said, I guess it wasn't that big a deal, although it was a big deal to me. In fact, when I got to school that day, I didn't do much teaching. We watched that game film over and over again. And I remember students come up to me and said, coach, this is going to get on ESPN. I said, ESPN? It didn't get a headline in the local Democrat and Chronicle. But of course, the students were right. We'll talk a little bit about ESPN as we close up here. Well, now we were trying to get ready for this sectional tournament. But what I didn't know and expect is I thought the media attention would, would just end there because it didn't make much of a deal. Well, what I didn't know is Jason's speech pathologist, he had never come to a game, but he worked with Jason for four years. He came to that game and he was so touched that the next day he called Channel 8 and he said, you've got to come and borrow the video from the coach of this game. It's the best thing I've ever seen in sports. They did, they showed it that night and they got such an overwhelming response that the next day we had three local TV stations come in. And then that night, Channel 13's Mike Canelano called me and he said, Coach, this game is awesome. Would you mind if I send it out nationally? I said, no, if it can make an impact on the country, I think it'd be wonderful. Well, it was a quiet weekend and we were going into our February break where our students were off from school, but we were practicing getting ready for this sectional tournament that we had never won. Well, Monday morning, I figured we're on, we're on for practice and things are going to be normal. Well, just before I leave for practice, the phone rings and I pick it up and it's CBS Evening News. And they normally don't call the house. They said, Coach, we've heard about the game. Want to come in and do a story? They did a story later that week and it just exploded. Meanwhile, we're trying to prepare our team for this sectional tournament. In, in the first round, we had a bye. And then in the second round, we played in the quarterfinals. We had a home game and we won that game quite easily. Give you an idea of media attention. After the game, we were interviewed by People Magazine, typical, typical interview. And I said to my athletic director after the game, just in case we have some media attention when we go back to school on Monday, could I have a sub? Give you an idea how much media attention we had. I had a sub for eight consecutive days. Yes, that's right, eight consecutive days, which leads me into my fifth key, which is lead by example. Because this is something that I really learned the hard way in my coaching career. Because as I became a better coach and we were having success, I really think I did a good job of leading by example during the season. But I realized one of the major factors why we were not doing well in the postseason was because of me. So look at yourself. What kind of leader are you consistently by example? What we always used to tell our players is that you are always on stage. And that's such a powerful thing to remember. And that's where I was falling down. And what I told myself before that sectional tournament, that I was going to be different. When we had adversity in a sectional game, I was going to stay strong. I was going to stay positive. I was going to be the rock for the players. Well, the other thing is, remember, they will follow more of what you do than what you say. And again, going back, we talk about trust, aligning words and actions. I was going to be tested. The semifinal game was Tuesday night. And we were up 10 points at halftime. And I thought, we've got this. We're going to do it. Well, unfortunately, we blew the entire lead. We're actually losing the fourth quarter. This time, I was different as a leader. I was more positive. I, the guys stayed together. We rallied and won the game. We are finally going to the sectional finals for the first time. And to give you an idea of media, the next three days were like a mini Super Bowl week, like at Greece Athena. We had a Japanese TV station come in. It was just crazy and bizarre. Well, Saturday night is the championship game at the Blue Cross Arena. How many of you have ever been at the Blue Cross for a game? Well, normally for a championship game, we've got three, four, sometimes 5,000 people who walk in Saturday night and we have 10,000 people there. It's sold out and it's crazy. And Channel 8 asked to interview me before the game. They asked me a couple of questions. They said, coach, can we interview J-Mac? I said, sure. So J-Mac's sitting in the first row. I was down on the floor. I turned to him, I said, J-Mac, Channel 8 watched the interview. He stands up, he says, coach, it's time to get focused. No media interviews. I thought we were ready. That was until our first sectional championship game. 
we were down 14 to three after four minutes. I was like, oh my gosh, that pregame speech didn't work well. But again, I stayed positive. Our players responded. We actually really tied the game. We had the ball late in the game tied. Our point guard penetrated in. He threw it out to one of our other guards. He makes a three, we're up three. Our opponent comes down, they miss a shot. It's a scramble for the rebound and whack, I got tackled by my JV coach. We indicated we were section five champs. We had finally done it. And in fact, after the game, we took our, our team to a local restaurant, actually watched highlights of our game on ESPN. That's how crazy it got. Well, we went, after that, we went in the state tournament and unfortunately lost at so the end of that season. But I'm often asked as we go into these last two keys, coach, how do you get to the top? And I've given you some ideas on that. But the other question that's even more difficult is how do you stay at the top? Because in our last 11 years, after never making the sectional finals, in our last 11 years, we made the sectional finals eight times and won six. So really, these were some of the keys. And key number six is what I call leave a profit. A leave a profit to me is number one, you, you got to keep getting better. How many of you have your own personal growth plan where you're intentional about getting better? Because I think that's hugely important. I'm just going to give you three quick tips. Number one is, are you a reader? In fact, I'm such an avid reader. I've read well over a thousand books on success and leadership and teamwork. In, in fact, I read a book every week now, and I posted it. So if you go on my website, coachjimjohnson.com, you can uh, follow me on social media. I do a book recommendation every Wednesday because it's that powerful. So feed your mind. Number two, for those that are driving, turn your car into a library on wheels. Feed your mind with audio programs, inspirational education. Heck, you can learn a foreign language while you're driving around. And then thirdly, is I call it the two for one. When I go for a walk, I'll listen to a podcast or if I cut the grass. So find ways that you can feed your mind when you're doing something like going for a walk or doing housework or whatever it happens to be. So keep getting better, which leads into what leave the profit is, is actually a leadership philosophy. And when we talk about leadership philosophy, I'm gonna share what ours was in just a moment, but I wanna just right now, Think for a moment, if you want, you can share in the chat, what is your leadership philosophy? Because of time, we don't have a lot of time for right now, but if you, you want to share, and uh, unfortunately, we're not going to have time for a, a Q&A, but I am going to stay around after I close. And if anybody does have questions, I'd be glad to stay around and answer any questions for you. Um, so think about what is your leadership philosophy? For us, our leadership philosophy and leaving a profit means everything that we touched, we wanted to turn to gold, not garbage. In other words, we wanted to make it better, not worse. And I'll give you an illustration. When we used to go to an opponent to play a basketball game, when we would walk in the locker room, we'd always talk about we want to leave the locker room in better shape than we, when we got there. So if I walked in and I saw a piece of garbage on the floor, what do you think I did? Yeah, I picked it up. Because again, we were teaching our guys everything we touch, we want to get better, not worse. And that's such a powerful thing. So think about what your leadership philosophy is and, and really focus on that. And does your team members, are they clear about that? Because that's such a powerful thing as you go through. And so wrapping up on number seven is that what we call servant leadership. And servant leadership is basically, it's not soft leadership. But it's the ability to flip the leadership traditional pyramid. And instead of you being on the top, you're on the bottom. And you're trying to find ways to serve your team members. And that what I found the best way to serve your team members is to help them become lead, better leaders, to teach them leadership. That's how you can leave the legacy. In fact, when I retired from coaching, I'm really proud to say we had made the sectional five finals four straight years. And my assistant that took over made the Section 5 finals three straight years after that. So I'm really proud that we were able to keep it. He's doing a great job of leading the program now. So are you, are you doing that where you're leaving the opportunity for things to get better because you taught leadership and helped people become better leaders? So what I'd like to do is I, I love quotes. I give a quote every day when we're at practice. 
And one of my favorite Americans is Dr. Martin Luther King, um, had a great quote. And he said, we, that we can all be great because service leads to greatness and we're all capable of serving. So really take that to heart, you know, in that we're all capable of serving and helping others. And just a, a last little thing to think about right now is think about one leadership idea you've learned and you want to embrace and start today. Write it down. If you want, you can put it in the chat. But again, because uh, of time, unfortunately, we're going to have to move on to the close of the story. But it is that really think about something that you can take away. We talked about goal setting. So in, in wrapping up, let's say being a teacher, of course, I got to do a little review before I give my final story. So in in review, first thing is, number one, is make sure that you have clarity of what your vision is, your personal mission, and the team mission, and are you living both consistently? Number two is making sure that you're finding ways to build trust. Have that plan how you're going to build trust. Number three is finding ways to create an edge. And we talked about goal setting. Work on those goals. Write them down. Put them on cards. Give you some ideas on that. Number four is effective communication, which of course we mean you want to become a better public speaker, but the most important thing is the two ears, one mouth, become a great listener. Number five, you are always on stage, so you need to lead by example. Number six, we talked about having a leadership philosophy. Ours was creating, or excuse me, leaving a profit. So we want to make sure that everything we touch, we want to make better not worse. And then number seven is the essence of leadership, in my opinion, and that is servant leadership. The ability to have that service mindset as a leader and to help develop other leaders is so powerful. So as I said, I'm going to stay around after I'm, I've got one final story to wrap up. And then uh, I would be glad to say, if I can ever help anybody, I'll, my website's in the, in the end uh, for one of my presentations, or if you ever want to purchase my book, A Coach and a Miracle, uh, it is on the website on a discount. It would include, I would be glad to sign it for you if you order it off the website and include a free bookmark for you with some of the tips that we talked about today. But in finishing up, I, I want to share this final story. This is actually a different story than Jason, but it really, to me, captures the essence of servant leadership. When I was at Greece Olympia, my third year there, I had a young man come into our program, and his name was Alex. And I, Alex came to me and said, Coach, I, I like basketball. I'd like to get involved in the basketball program. And I found out that Alex actually was born in Nigeria and came over to the United States in sixth grade to live with one of his brothers that had moved to the United States. And I started to get to know Alex that he was coming to our fall program. And then one day I said, Alex, what's your big dream in America? And he says, coach, my dream is I want to get a full basketball scholarship to a college here in the U.S. And Alex had some ability. I said, you know what? I think you, you could do it if you work hard and have a great attitude. Well, one week before the season was supposed to start Alex's junior year, I'm at the school in an evening. And we're getting ready for an open gym basketball. And I'm in my office. I get a knock on the door. I open it up and it's Alex and he's quite distraught. I said, Alex, are you okay? He says, coach. And then he broke down in tears. He says, I went home after school today. And my brother told me that we have to move again because of his job. Coach, this will be the fourth high school in three years. Is there any chance I can stay? I was like, geez, Alex, I don't know. So the next day I was at a family function. I brought up Alex's dilemma. And my aunt said, her name was Midge. She said, well, Jim, I can take Alex in for a week till we find him a home. Of course, that seven days turned into seven years. So Alex ended up moving in with my aunt. And the next part of the story didn't turn out that great. Alex was a pretty good player, but he had a subpar attitude and his work ethic wasn't very good. And he played okay as junior. He played a little bit better as senior, but not good enough to 
obtain a scholarship. And after a senior season, I went over to my aunt's house and we had a heart to heart with Alex, myself and my aunt. My aunt was such a great servant leader. And she said to him, Alex, you've got so much more to give. I know you can make your goal come true. You gotta go to this prep school and, and turn around your attitude and your work ethic. Well, Alex went to the prep school and finally the light came on. He knew, he knew he had to work harder. He knew he had to change his attitude and he had a great year at the prep school. And finally, his dream came true. He got an opportunity to get a full basketball scholarship through a division school in Vermont. But the story doesn't quite end there. Alex goes to the school, has a great career, and ends up being their senior athlete of the year. But it doesn't end there. Alex starts to interview for jobs, and one of the companies he interviews is a company you may be familiar with, MTV. And MTV offers Alex a job, and Alex starts working at MTV, and he realizes that there's very little presence in Africa. So Alex starts to convince the leaders in MTV that he could lead them and get them more involved in Africa. And about eight or nine years ago, Alex gets named MTV manager for Africa. And the next year, my aunt calls me one day. She says, Jim, Jim, you got to pick up Forbes magazine this week. And I said, yeah, Mitch, I don't read Forbes magazine. I read Sports Illustrated. She says, well, you want to read Forbes this week? And I said, why is that? Because Alex is on the cover. So you never know the impact you can make as a leader. And that's what you're really striving to do is to lead that legacy, is to shine the light on other people in making sure that you become the best leader that you possibly can so we can make this a better world for all. So thanks so much for having me. And if I can help you remember our action steps, starting with that personal mission, getting those goals down and being clear about your leadership philosophy. And then if I can ever help you, there's my website. And it was just great to be with you. Thank you and God bless. Thank you, Jim, so much. Um, really appreciate you speaking to us today. Um, we should, I think we're gonna have the um, SHRM credits and HCR credits um, come up. I'm not sure if Lauren can pop that up or not. If not, we can send it out to everybody. Um, but if anyone wants to stay on and ask any questions um, of Jim, um, feel free. And thank you for to our sponsor as well, Paylocity, for your support. Um, but I hope everyone has a great day today. And um, I'm going to let Jim hang out for a little few minutes and see if anybody has any questions. Feel free to ask. Well, let's see. I don't see any in the chat. Well, we do have your contact information, um, Coach, um, which is uh, behind you. I see that, and it's on the presentation as well. Um, just if anyone has any questions they want to ask him separately, I'm sure he'll welcome that. I'd be glad to. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, and uh, Michelle, if you don't mind, I'll follow up you. And if you uh, get a chance, I'd love a little bit of feedback from you, maybe in a few days or so. Absolutely. Of course, we can do that. We do send out a survey. Okay. Um, we've asked individuals to um, complete the survey um, for today's presentation. So, we'll be able to give you some feedback. Thank you. Very right. Okay. All right. I'll give it a Another minute. I think people are slowly signing off. Okay. So thank you again. It was great to have.